Welcome everyone to Coffee with the Codex. My name is Dot Porter and I am a curator in the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies at the University of Pennsylvania Libraries. Uh, the Schoenberg Institute is in the Kislak Center for Special Collections, Rare Books and Manuscripts. Uh, SIMS is what we call the Schoenberg Institute. So SIMS is a research and development institute focused on manuscripts. Um, we digitize our manuscripts. We also have physical collections. We do a lot of different stuff with them. And Coffee with a Codex is my weekly program where every Thursday at noon, I take a book off the shelf and either I or another one of our staff um, do a little informal show and tell about it. So this is informal. Feel free to uh, type questions or thoughts in the chat as we go and Amy and I will keep our eye on that. Um, yeah, so today's manuscript is MS Codex 723 and it is a uh, 12th century um, collection of canon law. Canon law being the sort of law of the Catholic Church through the Middle Ages. I, I don't actually know if they still, there must still be canon law, but it was a big deal in the Middle Ages. So this is one of a um, copy of a specific collection that I'll say a little bit more about. First, I want to point out that although the um, Manuscript. Most of what we will be looking at is um, 12th century, so it's pretty early. Is that right? Let me make sure. Yeah, 12th, 12th century. Uh, the binding is not. The binding is a modern binding, um, although it's on wood, which is quite nice, and it's got sort of a leather. Um, I have to be really careful with it because the front cover is is coming off. But I I just want to sort of show you here uh, what's going on. This is a big and chonky manuscript. I'm going to see if I can do this to sort of you can so you can see the side. This is this is a big this is a big big manuscript. Um, the as you'll see as we're going through the parchment itself is quite thick. I mean each each piece of parchment is thick and it's really crunchy, which is fun. So it should make a lot of noise as we're sort of going through. So I'm going to try to keep this um, it's sort of tipped sideways. You probably can't tell that, but there we go. Um, all right, so the manuscript is, as I said, uh, 13th century, um, no, 12th century uh, collection. The collection that this is, is, I have it, I have my notes, the Panormia, uh, which was written by, by um, is it Ivo, Ivo of Chartres, who was the um, Bishop of Chartres in um, the, from, from I think 1090 until his death, uh, which was in uh, 1115. So this was written, not this specific manuscript, but the text was written when, at the time that he was um, the, uh, the bishop and it was one of three collections of canon law that he was responsible for. Um, the, one of them is um, the tripartia, so-called because it's composed in three parts. The second one is the decretum. And then the third one is this one, uh, the panormia, which actually, from what I, can, uh, what I was reading about it, it consists of um, 920 texts that are actually taken from the decretum. And then um, the others are taken from um, other, other sources with a total of 1,038 chapters or sections that are divided into eight books. Unfortunately, I don't have the page numbers or the folio numbers for each section, uh, but we'll see maybe if we can figure out where they start and end. So this is the very first page. You'll see a number down here at the bottom, 193. This manuscript as um, some other manuscripts in our collection. Um, in fact, and a lot of manuscripts around the world were in the collection of uh, Sir Thomas Phillips, who was a collector in the 19th century. And he collected a whole lot of manuscripts, and this is one of them, and so we have it here. So that's what that number refers to. It was 193 in his collection. Um, the script, that this is written in as a transitional script. So we're, we're getting ready to, to 
get into uh, Gothic script, but there's still a lot of Carolingian um, looking stuff here. So that's that. It's fairly plain, although there are, as we can see here, there's you're going to see rubrication, you're going to see some large initials. There's no illumination, there's no gold, um, but there's some decoration going on here. Um, one of the things that I love in particular about this manuscript, those of you who have been here before will, uh, won't be surprised by this, there's a lot of um, interesting things happening with the format of the manuscript. So um, we have parchment that where you're going to see a lot of um, these edges, which means that this is a um, sort of a, this is either an armpit probably uh, or a neck uh, area. So it's really obvious this is parchment. We have a very light colored side and then a dark colored side because this is the hair side or the outside of the animal and this is the flesh side or the inside. So a lot of uh, clues that will tell us that this is uh, definitely made of animal skin, which I just think is pretty neat. Um, let's see. I will just sort of go along. One, another thing you'll see here is these, these sort of stubs between, um, between pages. Sometimes when you see these, it means that pages have been uh, removed like cut out of a book. These are paper though. This is part of the um, part of the binding itself. So when you see those, that's what's uh, that's what's going on there. Uh, one more thing I'll point out about the um, preparation of the book is that the the ruling is uh, visible here. So these are ruling lines down the side. They're made in lead or plummet, something like that, like a modern pencil almost. And um, you can't see them very much underneath the text, but they're on the edges, so you'll see those. And I think in some cases we can see pricking marks. So in fact, over here, these little, little holes along the edge, this is what the people who were preparing the manuscripts would use to make these straight lines there would be another little hole on the other side of the sheet and they're drawing between them. So that is that. And we've got some holes, little holes in the parchment. So the parchment is not in the most excellent condition, but the writing is pretty, is pretty uh, nice. And I think as we continue, we'll see more sort of notes, um, notes in the margin. Oh, here's some really, you can see the ruling comes all the way out into the margin here. Uh, I'm not sure why, um, but that's sort of, sort of interesting. Unfortunately, I can't comment too much on the text itself. Um, I will say the first section, or the, actually the section that we're on here is the sort of prologue uh, part of it. So we haven't even come into the, um, the main text yet, but you'll see we have red and blue initials uh, going back and forth between red and blue. So we have red and blue and red and blue, very little decoration. Um, and the, the reason that the, that the colors uh, go back and forth between red and blue is to sort of help the reader keep, um, keep their place and remember sort of which one. It sort of functions like uh, in a spreadsheet when you have gray and white and gray and white. Um, it's the same sort of, uh, same sort of idea. Um, there are also a few places it looks like somebody left a word out and so they came back in and fixed that. So we'll see more of that too, I'm sure, as we go. Um, as I'm going through, if, the, if you want to see uh, anything more closely, I'm happy to zoom in uh, at any point. So here, we're on 16 recto. This is where the uh, main text actually begins. And the first part is faith, heresies, and sacraments. So so the, the canons on these things are going to be in this section. 
Um, the, one of the things that makes it difficult as you're going through to sort of see where the different um, sections begin and end is that the initial that begins the new section is not really special. It's not very large. Um, in fact, it looks very much like the next one, which just introduces the next canon. Um, sometimes, like some manuscripts, you, it's, they make it very easy for you to tell what your new section is because there's going to be a great big beautiful initial. Uh, and that doesn't happen with here. Uh, it doesn't happen here. However, someone fairly recently uh, put a note, a very helpful note that says beginning of book. So um, someone, no, not Amy. Amy would not do that. Somebody before Amy uh, did that and uh, maybe, you know, uh, a seller when they were getting ready to sell it. So anyway, I've been chatting. Let's look at some more of this. Here we have some uh, marginal, marginal notes. Um, that, well, this is, that was interesting. So we've got two, two red letters in a row. I don't know what that is. There was something here that's been erased. Uh, and I think here too. So a book that's been used, people have written in it, and then also uh, erased things from it. They do look like um, they were glosses that were pre put in pretty much at the same time the book was written, though. These don't look like later, um, later notes. I'm seeing some names that I recognize. We have we have Gregory here and Zacharias Bonifacio Episcopo. Um, so again, I'm not sure what is happening, but it's interesting. I th I'm guessing that these are these are sections that were maybe written by these popes. I don't know. Um, I should learn more about canon law. Um, I'll point out here, oop, no, you can't see that. At the bottom of, of um, not every leaf, but at the end of every choir, uh, there's going to be, um, these are uh, going to be the numbers of the, like choir numbers, basically. So this is the end of the third choir. Uh, here, which is page 26. Uh, so that's the end of the third choir. And I've seen them throughout, and I think there are also, some of them have uh, um, catchwords. This one does not have a catchword, but some of them. Oh, in the form of a letter, Zacharias to Boniface. That's what, that's what it is. Right, Zacharias to, um, to Boniface. Thank you, Amy. All right. So Gregory the Third here. So it's a compilation of a lot of texts from a lot of different um, different places. As as Amy pointed out, from there includes letters um, and other other kinds of things. My understanding of the way that canon law sort of came around sort of organically a lot of the time. So someone would have a question, um, and so you write to the pope and say, oh no, this thing happened, you know, what do we do? And then the pope um, makes a decision, and then that gets written into a canon and gets passed around in these different collections. So here is, oh, again. So here's another choir signature for, and then um, the catchword, which should be the first word of the next page, and indeed, uh, Dominus, I think that is. And then if we look at the top, Dominus. So this is in the right, in the right order there. 
let's see. Doo -doo. It is, and it's very, it is very long, so I'm, I don't know if I'm going, ooh, this is, this is very nice pricking marks if you can see them over here on this side, um, and actually on both sides. Sometimes we don't have prick marks anymore in their manuscripts because they've been trimmed away, uh, but it looks like this hasn't been, hasn't been trimmed at all. Here we have another one there. Oh, Joyce says uh, it's, the manuscript uh, had been written before Chartres was constru constructed. The construction was started mid 12th century. The manuscript uh, said Iba was was bishop 1040. I thought it was 1090. I think he was 1090 to um, 1115 or 16 when he died. Um, but. I don't know if there would have been another, another. I assume there was another church there before the current, uh, the current uh, cathedral was there. So this is fun. This is there's been a, a cut. It looks like some maybe somebody. I don't know what happened, but there was a cut here, and it's been um, sewn up. Um, this has been clearly made after the manuscript was made at some point. It's hard to say exactly when. Sometimes you see um, places where when the parchment was being made, like there was a little hole, and um, it would be sewed up before the parchment is stretched, and then you have uh, little holes, and sometimes the thread is even still in there. We have some manuscripts where the thread is still there, so that's pretty, that's pretty neat. Right, oh, 1040. Uh, to 1116 are his life dates, not his bishop dates. So that makes more sense. 66 years seems like an awful long time to be, uh, to be a, a bishop. All right, and I have a little marker here because this is, there are three sort of fun things that are happening um, in the manuscript. Here is a canon table. Um, which is, let's see, uh, Solomon, Job. So this is the old, it looks like the Old Testament. And then, um, yeah. So I don't know exactly what this is doing here, but it is a neat thing. And I just noticed there is a little, a little fellow. I think that's supposed to be a face. It looks like a face to me. So, um, there's a little bit of color and a little playfulness there. And then, ooh, oh, I'm sorry. There we go. That's one of the problems with that. There we go. There we go. So there's that. So Joyce says, the Crypt of Chartres, uh, I'm probably pronouncing it terribly, I'm sorry, still exists and it dates from the 11th century. So that's what I thought. There was probably another church there um, before the current one was built, so there's another there. And again, I'm checking Fuerit and Fuerit up at the top. Um, I, I believe that the manuscript is imperfect. Um, it ends uh, before the end, so there's a section missing at the end, but there's nothing missing in the middle. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, here we have a, oh, you can't, there we go, boop, boop, little hole. Oh. This, is this a patch? It looks like there's a, something happening here. I don't think. No, it's just a really thin area of skin. Have you seen that? It's written over, so it was there originally. You all see that? I'm not sure what is happening there. It's something something with the skin. 
interesting. But it did not keep them from uh, from using the parchment. It was t still usable. Um, I got a private message uh, pointing out the nice variety of the capital forms. Uh, I'm not sure it was intended to be a uh, private message, but uh, but there are the, I mean, the capitals, I haven't really been pointing them out, but they are. It's like they're just decorative enough, right? Like it's not, it's not designed to be a very beautiful, impressive manuscript. This was probably, I mean, it's a collection of canon law. It was maybe a reference text um, that, you know, someone would actually use to try to make you know, legal, legal decisions, or maybe an, just an educational text if you were learning about it. I don't think there's any indication of how exactly this book was used or where it was at the time it was used. Um, so, the, so the fact that the parchment is not great makes a lot of sense. Um, and they've included sort of just enough um, decoration, but also in addition to kind of being pretty and also kind of funny. So here's another little, little deck. Oh, stop it. There we go. Little decorative maybe face there. Um, you know, the scribe was having a bit of fun um, or, you know, whoever was putting in the initials, the, the artist scribe. Um, and a little, just a little bit. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned, it also serves, it serves a purpose. You know, it's not just to be pretty. It is actually to um, help uh, figure that out. So Joyce is asking about the script and the margins. I mentioned it earlier. I'm pretty sure that it's contemporary. Yeah, and Amy's saying it's contemporary. Now, whether that's the same person um, I, it's a little, it would be hard, I mean, it's hard to tell in any case. It looks like the same kind of script. Uh, to me, the ink is different, at least here. The ink is lighter. Um, and so what I would, what I would guess is that the book was written and then sometime not much later, uh, someone or someone's else came through and did it. I can tell you in the record, it says that the manuscript, the main text of the manuscript is one, is assumed to, you know, is has somebody who, who isn't me uh, says it's one hand, but I think that the notes, um, I, d I don't think it says anything about the notes, so that's probably um, up in the air. Let's see. It just goes on and on. I have to say, I really like these initials with where the, where the both of the colors are there. I think those are just, they're quite pretty in a sort of plain-ish way. Um, although it's not as plain, I was thinking about a manuscript we looked at back last year sometime that was a um, Cistercian one. I think it was maybe from around the same time, but that, the Cistercian movement was sort of a, a reaction against um, the, uh, the the sort of Benedictine, uh, and um, they thought that the Benedictines were too worldly and had too much money, and so they really simplified things. Um, and this is sort of between uh, less than that, so it's a little bit simple, but not as simple as the Cistercian manuscript. Let's see, I have two more. I'm just having fun sort of paging. Oh, look at that. That's green. That's green. Suddenly, there's green. Um, I don't know if that is, I don't know what's going on there. I don't know why there's, that looks green. Um, so that's maybe somebody came and did that, added that later, I don't know. Um, oh, Linda, oh, you don't want to know how it smells. <laughs> no. So Linda is asking about how old parchment, does old parchment have a different smell than old paper? 
Um, it depends on the parchment. This, this doesn't really smell like much. Mostly it doesn't smell like much. Um, but sometimes, sometimes it does. We have a few books um, that are quite, that are quite uh, smelly. But we also have paper books uh, that are quite, um, quite smelly. And I don't really know. See, there's more green. It's very random. I don't know if you can see how green that is, but it's definitely not. It's, it is green, I promise. Um, no, it doesn't look green online. It, it really is. It, oh, and that's green too. Can you see the difference between the green and the blue? No? Okay. I'm not lying to you, <laughs> but it's, it's really funny. Um, so I don't know, uh, to get back to sort of Linda's question about the smell of it, I would love to know more about how, um, what makes the books uh, smell and why they smell because some of them are really quite. So here's more, so there's more green. I'm seeing more and more green. So maybe it was just another, another scribe who came through. Does that look green? No, I can see it just looks dark, doesn't it? Okay. So that's interesting. So I, I'm mindful that we are, we're low on time. So I'm just gonna, oh, scooch a little bit forward because the whole reason, the whole, I hate admitting this, but the reason that I, that I wanted to um, show this book is because it has this initial, you've all seen this because I used it in the advertising, but this uh, initial with this guy hanging, hanging from it, he's hanging from it, his little feet are hanging down. And I just thought this was great. And it turns out he is the, he is the most decorative thing that's happening here. And I'm just noticing this is Explicit Lieber. So this, oh, Explicit Lieber Sext. So this is the end of book six. And then we're starting book seven. So remember at the beginning, I said sometimes they have really, uh, really fancy uh, initials that start this books. Well, here we go. Here's the one place in the manuscript where we have a fancy, uh, fancy initial starting it. So there we go. Uh, Karen is asking, could the green be the result of chemical reaction? Um, I, it could, but then I'd expect to see more of it. And it's just strange. I would expect to see no more blue and only green, but it's clear because here we have, this is blue and this is a green, this has a green line in it. Ugh. So, um, so maybe, but it, it, it looks more like it's a purposeful use of green. They just started using green. And one more thing before we end, the, the last, is it the last section? Um, so parts, uh, this must be part seven is about the disillusion of marriages. So there's a whole section on not divorce, but disillusion of marriages. And this is a chart of consanguinity that has not been uh, has not been filled in. So this is a kind of the chart of consanguinity is like who you're allowed to marry given your blood relations. And so this would of course be an important section, uh, an important part of a section on the disillusion of marriages and also marriages. So that's section six and seven. Um, and then part eight, uh, which is going to be towards the end. Uh, is murder, magic, and demons, which uh, sounds like pretty interesting, uh, pretty interesting thing to end with. So it is 1230. Yes, Marie says that sounds like a good time. Um, so it is 1230. So we'll end, we'll end with uh, murder, magic, and demons. And uh, thank you, Amy, for your, uh, for your assistance. And thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, and we'll look at more manuscripts uh, later on. So we'll see you later. Thank you. Mm -hmm.